So you sat here and came up with a bunch more questions. When you did, you listen to the last well, podcast. You know, Skip. Yeah, um, you know, it was so awesome to sit with you. You know, a couple of weeks ago, and when you left, I started thinking, wow, I didn't get halfway through all the questions and and you know the the things I wanted to talk to you about, and it was like. You're our first double header. <laughs> so thanks for coming back. Um, I know that you went back to Capos uh, for this last week, but uh, now that you're back and we're sitting here, um, you know, we were talking about all the, the world records on light tackle and traveling the world, but you guys were as much known for your partying and, and your, your craziness and the chaos as you were your fishing, don't you think? I don't know if we were known for it. It was just part of the life in the 80s like that. It was, you know, when when a fisherman gets back to port, you know, they want to go out and let their hair down and, and, and chase some girls. And you end up uh, running the beach here in Fort Lauderdale, up and down the beach. And it was pretty crazy back in those days anyway. So it seemed like uh, our boat would end up being a party late at night quite a bit. The boss was pretty relaxed about those sort of things, even when he was on the boat. So we kind of had a... The, the green light no matter if he was on the boat or not oh that's you know it, it, because i think that the whole country is, was almost like in a state of anarchy at, at one point near that era because it was post-vietnam the sexual revolution was going off uh nixon was out uh pot smoking um was in and it was almost like a rebellious state um that no we're going to live our lives the way we want to live our lives and it was the first time you know the old school was kind of like being challenged by a younger generation and i, I saw that too with the ski race stuff yeah you know um how'd you come out with the uh get to be known as the texas terrors um if i believe correctly i think some writer tagged that on us um in about 82 i believe it was and um Dunaway loved the name. It just stuck overnight. And believe it or not, in 83, Dunaway sold the boats, the boat, and sold his business. And we hooked up with uh, Tom O'Connell on a 54 Bertram. He had a boat called Renegade. And Jerry and Tom got together and put their money together to fish all the tournaments. So the Renegade actually kind of took over that name right. and kept it. We ended up not using it when we, in 86 because we weren't quite the Texas terrors anymore, terrorizing Texas. We we're getting ready to leave the, the country for a few years. So ended up the Renegade ended up taking that name over. But for uh, 83, we uh, in 82, actually, when they tagged us with that, we went over to Texas and we fished the tournament circuit. And I think we got three first place um maybe a second and a third and a couple of last i mean we it was unbelievable you, you season. dominated yeah and i think that's when that uh line tagged us because i didn't know if it was based on partying or or your success in the domination on the, on no, the open there, water there was not that many parties in texas it was hard <laughs> to find a party in texas it's that coast was pretty bland back then you know you had to drive Brain. into houston to get a good meal or chase girls and as you went down to Port O'Connor, there was nothing down there at all. Um, and uh, Port Aransas was pretty dead back pretty then. Boring. So, yeah, it was pretty, the coast was pretty dead at that time. Unless spring break I heard about down in South Padre got pretty crazy, but uh, right. we never got dead in the spring. We were always down there in the late summer. One of the funny stories that I read in your book was talking about these, uh, there was a bet who had, who could find the, 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 the largest woman, right? <laughs> there was an outrigger hanging with some extra large panties uh, that was, the next morning. <laughs> that was in the early years. That was in Cozumel. Yeah, we, we, we formatted uh, what they did in Poco Bueno when they auctioned each boat off. And for fun, there was two of two boats going down. And we got to, <laughs> we got to Cozumel. And I think uh, it had to be the rum or something else. But we uh, came up with the idea of going out that night and chasing girls and whoever had the biggest pair of panties won the pot. So we all put in some money and then we auctioned everybody off. And it was one guy that he, he never, he couldn't score. So I kind of spread a little secret around everybody that when he comes up, only bet nickels, don't bet dollars. Like Kunta went for a hundred bucks, you know? So he came up, we got up to a quarter and I said, sold. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody had any faith in him. 
But anyhow, it was a fun night. I mean, it was crazy. We jumped in the cab. We got to the city, and everybody started running up, asking girls to dance. I mean, <laughs> as soon as we got in the bar, there was no drinks, no nothing. Everybody had a good time with it. But there was a winner. There was a big set of bloomers in the other boat. They won. They put them on the outriggers. Oh, yeah. They were hanging. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. But, uh, but your brother, Kent, Kunta, he, he was a wild man, huh? Yeah. Yeah. There was no, no, nothing was safe with my brother. Nope. Was it... Uh, Tell, tell me some of the you know accolades that you have. Uh, obviously, you guys had a celebration of life, and your mother was telling a story about about your brother. Oh my gosh, the stories! The, even just like when mom was on the boat, nothing was sacred. My mom was. Uh, she was cool with it all. Oh yeah, she back then we all wore those short sportive shorts, and if you were sitting in the cockpit, and my brother was standing up on the bridge, well, they, you didn't wear any underwear back then. If you wore underwear and they got wet, you'd end up with pimples all over your butt right so everybody just wore just the sport of and nothing underneath them so if you're in a cockpit and you looked up on a bridge and my brother was standing up there sitting on the steps your gear would be hanging out so my mother would complain all the time about you know tuck that thing in or put it away or you know go get some longer shorts so it was quite the sight but the one of the, fu one of the funny stories is first thing in the morning kunta would smoke a joint and then we you know, take off. Mom's on the boat, mom and dad and some guests. And we get about halfway across from, from Cozumel to the mainland. He smokes another joint. And we put the baits out and we're fishing. And about 10 o'clock back in those days, they used to drink Miller Lite on ice, you know, beer on ice, make it last all day. So my mom goes, Kunta, get me a beer and a glass of ice. Mom, it's only 10 o'clock. She says, Kunta, you smoke two doobies. Go get me a beer. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think one of the funny stories you were mentioning and, and, and speaking about was when you guys were in South Lake Tahoe. And oh, uh, oh my gosh. tell me that one. Oh, well, Kunta was known, known for his exploits. And my dad and I decided to hop in the van and go. We're going to go to the casino and, and gamble for a couple hours. And so we leave the house and there's my brother and my sister and some friends and my mom and we get on the road. My dad turns around to me and looks at, looks at me and says, you think Kunto hit on mom while we're gone? <laughs> <laughs> I about drove off the side of the road. <laughs> it's the funniest lines my dad probably hit me with in many years. Oh my gosh. How did you, uh, tell me about um, Bill Lyons. Bill Lyons was a tax attorney from Texas. And he had a passion for marlin fishing and a great spirit. And um, he would uh, first charter us with his uh, beautiful wife, Connie. And he'd bring another couple with him, usually, uh, or a friend. Fast Eddie was one of the guys. And there was a few others he brought with us. But he had the passion. And he liked to try new things. He, he pushed me to my limit as far as trying new things, um, bringing ideas and he liked filming everything, you know, and he used to fish with Black Bart in Hawaii a lot. So he brought some things over Bart was doing and showed me. And he was just, like I said, he pushed me to my limits. But you get him in the chair, and, and we were fishing uh, 80s back then in uh, Cueva, Hannibal Bank. And we actually caught the biggest marlin we caught all season with him. We caught a 713 or something with him. Another little boat hooked up next to us on one of the club boats. And they're getting ready to cut the line because they had to be in by like three o'clock. And uh, they called us. And so Bill said, let's go over and get their angler and put them on the boat. So we did. And they were a couple of Germans. And actually, the one German had won a gold medal in the Olympics. I forget what four off the top of my head. Um, but anyhow, we put them on the boat. And they had hooked up at the same time we did. And their fish ended up weighing 690. We caught it at night. And I think they drank all the scotch on the way in. But they were pretty happy getting back to the dock when we weighed those two fish. But Bill was like that. He was sharing his boat, sharing his uh, life. Connie was a great cook. She'd give us haircuts, too. <laughs> she had done hair. Of course, being down there for three months on an island, you needed a haircut. Even I did back then. Um, but he was just such an a innovator. And he ended up uh, fishing a bunch off of Texas after, you know, in his late years he bought a merit boat and uh i even flew out there one time and he had files and files of satellite information on marlin that we studied and, and went through and i mean he had so a he passion. was as driven if not more so than most of the captains yeah yeah well he's so the line in your book says that he told you 
Skip, you'd be great if you'd stop partying. Yep. Yeah. Did that influence you in any way? Huge. It was a huge influence to hear someone say that. I wasn't partying like my brother, but I guess it was enough that he could see the difference in me, whether it was mood swings, whatever it was. But when he told me that that night, that was, I quit everything, 1983. I'll never forget it. Are you totally clean? Oh, yeah. Yep. I, you I stopped drinking at, the t- at that time or? I didn't really drink or, that. Or drugging or whatever it was. I was smoking a little bit of weed and drinking, drinking rum, but to me it wasn't hard partying right but it was just enough to alter your mindset and even though sometimes you think if you smoke the joint you almost can concentrate better right. on certain things but for me that was the end i didn't no more ha- you know you know it's interesting that you say this because when i was on the olympic team i was younger and i didn't really understand that uh, you know how serious uh it was at the time because when you're you know in your early 20s you, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. You know, you have boyfriends and girlfriends and, you know, everybody's drinking a little bit, having fun and partying. But back in my generation, there was really not a lot of money uh, available unless you were the best in the world. And I wasn't even close to that. But once I got out and, 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 and my years with the U.S. ski team was over, I started reflecting back because it felt like I got more serious when I became a fisherman. Then I realized what I was doing as a fisherman. I had a second chance to do something well. And had I had that focus as a skier, I think it would have been a whole lot better because when I became a fisherman, it was I was I took it very, very seriously. Probably more so than I was as an Olympic skier. And no one that I was competing with in all the tarpon tournaments and the keys had that kind of mindset. And I can see what you're talking about, what Bill was talking about, because once you decide that I'm going to go to the next level and no one's going to outwork me, no one's going to outsmart me, and they're not going to compete with me unless we have bad luck. And that's probably the same that uh, that you realized when Bill came to you. Well, the unfortunate part about being in the, the fishing business, even ch- starting from your charter, my, my charter days, is all your guests are down there to let their hair down and have a good time. There was people that would bring cocaine on the boat. You know, they'd be partying all the time. And then the next charter come in and they'd bring cocaine on the boat and be smoking weed all day. So you kind of got used to that party atmosphere that it was okay because you got millionaires bringing stuff on the boat. So you're introduced to the party life every day. It's, so it's, it's, it's exhausting too. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, here you're watching it going on every day. It was so easy to justify. It's like, oh, if they can do it, we can do it. They right. wanted to do it with us. And the next charter does it. So next thing you know, you're wrapped up in that life. And fishing seems pretty easy. You go out to put the baits out, you catch a few fish, you get in, you drink, you're going out. Life is good. You're you, As a crew, you're living the life of a multimillionaire on somebody else's dollar. Right. Using their boat. Hey, girls, come on, come on the boat. You know, so you're you're just having a time of your life at that age. There is no concentration. There is no hardly goals. These kids today out there fishing, they are goal oriented. They're up first thing in the morning, rigging baits. You don't see that party life going on anymore. You'll see them have their cocktails when they come in, but you you, you don't see that party life as much anymore. Right. I don't. I know the guys on the charter docks see a little bit more. They're exposed to it being on the beach and, the, and that sort of party life, but the crews that are out there sport fishing, they are so dialed in. And we didn't have that. You know, back then there was only a tournament here, a tournament there, you know, three or four a year. There was like four or five in Texas at the time, only a couple here in South Florida. Now there's a tournament every weekend and the guys get to fish a lot of them. So they're really concentrated. Uh, I think they're more focused like like you got later in life. Right. For me, the era you're talking about coming out of 83, you know, we were chartering a lot and bosses fishing a lot. And it was just fun fishing or record you know learning we we're just learning about how to catch records back then and once i i focused a little bit more it was crazy because like when i went to africa in uh 87 88 um actually we left uh january 88 to go over february march we left march of 88 we got to africa i didn't drink or anything i didn't want to do anything at all i wanted to fish from sun up to sundown and a little bit more if i could i didn't want to feel bad in the morning and i didn't want to drink and go get aids for any reason right <laughs> chasing girls over there so i shut down everything and most of the time i would I even you know here you got a, a, a yacht full of liquor you got everything you want the beer didn't even taste good after a while right because we stacked so much <laughs> beer on the american beer on the boat 
So you didn't even like it after a while. It was just all about fishing. In Australia, the fishing was so great. You wanted to be on top of your game. You're afraid of those big fish hurting you. Right. You're not afraid, but, but you want all accidents your accidents take place when you're not. Yeah, you uh, you need every brain every cell, a you, game going, your, vi- your, your 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 peripheral vision at its best, so you can see anything coming. You just need to be on top it of must it. Must have been horrible too, having a hangover and going offshore on those big seas. Yeah, some oh. I guess some guys get used to it, but I didn't want any part of it. It just you wanted yeah. to be at your best. Do you think because of all the partying, that's how Kunta ended up uh, where he was? You know, as an addict. Yeah. Or do you think that's more DNA stuff? I think it's more DNA stuff. I mean, he didn't drink when he was younger. He just smoked a little bit of weed. He hardly drank. We always said he'd never have a Miller time. Right. (laughs) That commercial was out back then. And, you know, but he was exposed to that party and every day, you know, when he came back here in the charter dock. And then he was uh, in Texas when he quit me, he he was living with a stripper. And uh, he ended up actually being a male stripper for a short while. But her being a stripper, it was that crazy sex life, multi, you know, right. girlf- girlfriends of hers and the partying uh-huh. and the drugs. So I think once you're exposed to that and the more and more you are, it's just, and then it starts hitting those certain brain cells that people get affected and he just yeah. never could stop. He was just always on and off. I think I put him through three or four rehabs. And he just never. He would do good for a little while. Take ownership and, and want to just go to the He just couldn't find that inner peace. Yeah. It, was, it was sad. He loved making everybody else happy, though. He'd go out of his way to make you laugh and do anything for you. But he couldn't sit by himself and look at himself. You yeah. Know, even though that serenity's out there when you're fishing. We talked about that last time. We can go fishing and catch nothing and just enjoy the birds and the trees and the watercolors and the, the other fish passing by that we're not <laughs> interested in catching, whether you want to call it a porpoise or a shark or whatever swimming by that we see the the great stuff we really appreciate now in our lives yeah well listen i'm really sorry that your brother's passed but uh his memories are going to live long and and large oh i wanted to write a book about him but i had to get a ghost writer to sit with him because of all the crazy stuff he did after i left right you know as our lives separated and he went his way but the, the, the other stories that I know of, they're just crazy. It would have been it would have been better than Hunter S. Thompson or anything. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> the um, one of the things I love about fishing, and and you hear this these stories told by almost everybody that is a fisherman. When you leave the dock in the morning, Flip Pallet says, "When my hand leaves the dock, when I push the boat away." Steve Huff talks about when I put my throttle down. He says. And he's leaving, and he gets up on plane. I am free. He's a good one. Yeah, you know, and I and the offshore boats. I've always been captivated by the sound and the rumble of the engines. Not necessarily the diesel smoke and fumes. I mean, obviously those are horrible, but I love the rumbling of, of that engine. Uh, tell me about the music that that engine uh, portrays. I grew up you. on a drift boat. And when you started up in the morning, I'd love the smell of that diesel. <laughs> Back then, I could almost stand behind a bus and because I knew I was going fishing. Right. So I guess it affects different people. But the the engine noise, to me, I think it's uh, it's so important. I, I really believe that that sound really attracts fish. It raises fish. Yeah. Sound travels seven times faster in water than it does on land. And after I got off the hooker, I ended up working with the Navy and the University of Miami. We built a boat called the Sound Machine. And we put speakers in the hull really? to play at a low frequency. And when it worked, it worked. We were having trouble keeping the speakers together. We had 50-pound magnets driving the, the fluid to drive the fluid outside the boat to make the water move. And uh, it was very interesting. But after going through all that, I know there's a lot more to sound. I mean, with, but this is only my belief. But even when I used to fish outboards in my younger days trying to troll, you would have to put them at about 1,800 RPMs to get eight knots. It was kind of a whining sound. Now with these four strokes, I believe they're catching more fish because it's a lower frequency. They're not whining like they used to. To me, it's changed what I can hear. So when you go to diesels and you hear that low rumble, it's it's so important. They're going to hear that. Just think how far that sound's going. Right. Is it going forward? But you take the diesel sound, whether it's a ship going by or whatever it may be, and if you're a fish swimming at 120 feet, your lateral line's picking up different frequencies. It's picking up the weak and wounded. It's picking up, uh, you know, all sorts of sounds. So when a boat goes by, if a fish can hear that rumble and they look up, what did they used to see when you, when I was fishing in the beginning? Two little tiny teasers next to the boat, maybe just splashing, ballyhoo's splashing on the surface. And 
look at what they're doing now. They put those dredges out. It's changed the fisheries so much. Now you got a big school of fish right near the boat. So the fishes, they hear that rumbling of those diesels and they look up. School of fish. And here, and they're used to seeing floats them with you know bait mm-hmm. around it, but now right. they got a boat going by, but they see this whole school of fish going by. Now the guys got swimming ballyhoos on jay hooks. They're not skipping anymore, so they're a little bit under the water. We're starting to take steps down deeper to In the raise water billfish. Column. Yeah, to, to the raise water. billfish. So it's changed it completely. As far as your tarpon concern, when I when I was in St. Thomas, I was changing the props on the on the sound machine, and I'm down there and I look around. I didn't see hardly any fish around at all. And I went, wow, I want to listen to the speakers while I'm down here, see if they're working. So I popped my head up. I said, hey, Scott, go turn the the sound machine on. And I went back down there and you can hear it going. And all of a sudden I look and there's a mangrove snapper, a couple of snappers coming in. And all of a sudden the tarpon come in and they're all wheeling around looking like, oh, it's feeding time. What's going on in here? And out of nowhere, in a short time, those speakers attracted all those fish in that bay. That's Red crazy. Hook. Yeah. Are boat manufacturers now trying to take a closer look at what kind of a sound they want that boat to make? No, they're, they're not too concerned about the sound. I think they're more concerned about the color of the carpet and the drapes to attract the women in there to okay the, the men to buy the boat. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they do make sure their bottom gear is perfect. I mean, there was one boat that fished a BBC years ago, and he didn't catch a fish in all four or five of the tournaments. And they went back and got that boat dialed in. Maybe it was a bearings or rudders clunking or whatever it may be. And they came back and they won the BBC, I think, the next year and placed in so many t- tournaments. So getting your shafts and props and rudders and all that running gear right is so important. Whether painting squid or bonitas on the bottom of the boat, I'm not sure how much that adds to it because all the guys put these little fish underneath the bottom of the boat, painted right. it on the bottom. But keeping your gear, gear dialed in. So when it comes back to d- diesels, I don't think there's one that's better than the others, but they all make that low frequency. If you think about it, if you pull up to a stoplight in South Florida or probably anywhere, you don't hear the treble of those boom boxes. You hear the, 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 bass. the bass. Right. It's that low frequency. When University of Miami was working on that sound, they would throw a hydrophone in the water right there in Biscayne Bay or whatever you call the thing that intermitted with speaker, some sort of speaker. They had hydrophones and speakers. They wanted to listen to everything. They would turn it on and the fish would come in, the mackerel would get aggressive and everything, and they turn it off and everything would mellow out and move out. And uh, that's some of the, the, the information I was working with from the University of Miami. And it was so interesting. And there's a guy out there that made a small speaker. He calls one a Mako magnet, a tuna magnet, I think. But they're to me, they're just a little too small. They don't, they're not that low frequency that I was taught by the University of Miami we needed. But the guys all put them in their boats and tried them, and one boat won a tournament with them. And next thing you know, everybody had to have them. But I haven't seen them really come out. When I when I sent that one to Miami to test, they said the frequency was too high. Um, wrong or right, who knows? It was just right. one person's opinion. But um, I haven't seen any come out there like that. But it, it's coming, believe me. Interesting. We spent one hundred and fifty thousand dollars on ours, and we finally gave up. We couldn't keep the face on the outside. The boat did thirty knots, and you got a rubber gasket. To be able to move the, the 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 fluid I put inside the boat between the the magnet and we had about a 18 inch square area and it had to fill and I think it took uh, uh, two to three gallons of fluid and we would put vodka in there not water because vodka was lighter than water to be able to move with the magnet to move the water outside. Oh, how crazy. So everybody thought I had to drink and have it, buying all that vodka all the time. But anyhow. <laughs> it was to raise fish. Yeah. Help raise and fish. Then, it, then we'd rip the rubber off and all the fluid would be going out. We'd have salt water in there and it wouldn't have it wouldn't be able to move it as much as move the water with those speakers. Wow, how sophisticated is that? It was crazy. Yeah, that boat was a, she was a special, it was a GNS also. After I got off the hooker, we went and built that boat and, and uh, the owner's name was uh, Mr. Love, and he, he he tried his best, and he finally gave up. We were hauling the boat out all the time, putting new, new uh, faces on there to, to move. It was a shame he gave up. I would love to continue with it. Yeah. Uh, tell me about the promised land. I, the last time we spoke, we were talking about Madeira, you know, the greatest big game fishery in the world, but you were saying in that part of the world. But I think you are mentioning, the, talking about the promised land being Australia. You just mentioned that and about the big fish down there. I think I think the only people that knew about Madeira back in uh, in the 80s was uh, people making wine 
and uh and European vacations, the fishery was just not there at the time. They probably knew there was tuna there and a lot of other stuff in Madeira. But Australia has been the spot since probably uh, the early 70s, maybe even the 60s. I forgot what year George Bransford, he flew over there during the war and uh, went back there and caught the first marlin. George Bransford was right here from right here in South Florida. But he went back over there and really discovered the fishery. But Australia, when you're talking about big game, the most granders ever caught still to this day have all been out of Australia and the odds of getting one, I wouldn't know what they are, but I mean, you that, go out there and catch a seven, 800 pounder. I mean, it's still bigger than probably any Marlin people have caught ever in the Atlantic. Right. You know, so to go out there and the neatest thing about going to Australia is you don't fish from sun up to sundown. You get up in the morning, you have breakfast on the mothership or on the game boat. Back in my day, there wasn't too many big enough game boats to mother to have it be its own fish feed, you know, feed you and everything right. else. You had to get a mothership back in those days. The boats were like forty feet, so you get on the mothership and and they weren't even that big. It was just like a yacht, and you'd have your breakfast, and then the crew would take you out to the to the reef, and you'd do a snorkel dive and look at giant clams and weird looking fish you'd never seen before. And then you get back on the boat and rinse off. And then next thing you know, you had to go catch all your bait. You had to catch your scads and your bonitas and whatever you could catch for scaly mackerels, whatever, you know, whatever you could catch, you almost could put out. But you're really concentrating on getting a lot of scads because the bitey gang out there, your kudas and mackerels would eat your baits all day long. So you had to have plenty of scads. And you'd catch bait and then clean the bait. Then about 11 o'clock, you stick your nose out there to start fishing. And you'd only fish till about four o'clock because if you hooked up after that, you wouldn't be able to get back inside the reef. It was just so hard to navigate. And some boats did. Some boats would fish till you know, like five and really push it. But if you hooked that big girl at five and had to fish into the night, you couldn't hardly get back inside that barrier reef. It's got to be so scary, right? Yeah, and it was before GPS. I'm sure GPS right. has helped them somewhat. But they have these things that, that they, they call them a balmy. And it's just like a round piece of coral growing up in the bottom in the middle of nowhere and it comes up within about three or four feet of the surface so you don't see them it's, it's well like, you can see them but coming at night they're everywhere they're just like you know bowling pins everywhere and I, uh, the, one of the first nights when i got to run a boat when i got the hooker out there i had a fish take me offshore so i came in in the night <laughs> and it was crazy because i'm looking you know i'm in the tower i got spotlights on i'm just barely putting in and out of gear and just you know you're doing one knot all the way in to get in and that's the way you'd have to get in. You get both your crew, your deckhands up on the bow, and they're looking with you. They got spotlights, or you got a spotlight up in the tower, and you're bumping and bumping and pitting and weaving, and it's just not worth it. It's so dangerous. I don't understand why they would go out so late in the day if they only had such a, a small they number of hours to fish. It's almost like uh, Panama, where they, they just don't bite in the morning. Oh, that's very it. Very seldom. Very seldom. You can fish all day, but... All you're doing is feeding the kudas and stuff. Right. What uh, what do you think turns the bite, turns these fish on? Who knows? In Panama, like a Tropic Star Lodge, you fish from sun up till about 10 o'clock, and then the black over. marlin shut off. Yep, very seldom you get a bite. And the boats go in about 3 in Tropic Star Lodge. I used to go back to the, the reef about 3 or four, uh, three because I didn't have to be in for any reason. Every once in a while, I would get a bite out of a black late. But it was crazy. It was They've been sitting there all bite. day. But that morning bite, four or five boats are hooked up. Black marlin jumping everywhere. It's going to be a great day. 10, 11 o'clock, it's over. Crazy. I mean, you know, we were talking about uh, all these world records that you guys were catching on four-pound test. Uh, what was the uh, your leader weight? Like 400 pound? You know, the the, the shock? In fly fishing, we call that the, 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 the shock tippet. You know, from the hook to the class tippet. Yep. So... What was your connection knot, and how heavy was that monofilament coming off the hook? Uh, it changed for each different line class we were using. IGFA rule says on 20 pound and under, you can only have a 15 foot leader, and the leader's measured from the the where the the end of the hook right up until the, the where it attaches to the snap swivel. You can only have 15 feet, so it's not very much on catching an animal that's probably you know, nine foot long. Right. So from the mouth, the leader coming out, there's not much leader there. The tail's almost hitting the boat when you're grabbing the leader. Right. And how heavy was that leader? Um, Like on 16 pound, I, they didn't have too much heavy leader back then. I did have some 600 pounds. So on 16, I'd probably use the 600. It's like rope. 
No, nah, not really, but you'd think it was. It's yeah. almost the size of the, some of the wires we're talking on here right. that are on the table. And then on the uh, four pound, when we caught the first one ever in Cape Verde, the fish was only 83 pounds, but we were using 300, 400 pound liter back then. It had to be something that could take that initial. Sometimes they would take off and you'd have to turn them over in the air. Sometimes they'd stop and gag right? because of, of where the hook was placed. So you could go a little bit lighter. The the one my favorite record we talked about last time was 162 pound on on uh, four pound in the Pacific. A lady caught. I only had a 120 pound leader because I was sail fishing. Right. So we so couldn't. You, we you couldn't just hang it, on. Yeah. You'd break it. Yeah, we couldn't just hang on to that one. But that was the that was the only advantage you had to take to take advantage of on all that light tacking, whether six, eight pound. We had to use 400 pound leader because when it came to the end game, you're going to get one shot. The mate had to grab the leader, hang on, and hopefully get some gaffs yeah. in it. What so what the, the connection between your mono and that four pound? How would that what what does that look like? Because in fly fishing, we use now today we used to the fly guys back in the day. A number of years ago, they were using like 80 and 100 pound test mono off the fly and using a, uh, a huff and eagle knot, which is a combination of two knots. You've got the bimini twist and you got a figure eight on the 80. And you weave that through the figure eight, tighten the figure eight, and then you half hitch it and then tie a risotto knot. So, what's your connection with the offshore guys? It was very easy because you got your leaders already made up, they've got crimps on them. So, you got a crimp on each end and a loop on your leader. But to go to your snap swivel, I would use the biggest snap I could, like a Marlin's snap. Because when a mate reaches out to grab the leader, I wanted that little bit of thickness in the that swivel. Edge. I just didn't use a swivel that would have been big enough. It's just tiny. It helped, gave us a little bit more grip. And from there, we would have maybe a two to three foot double line. And the only reason we used the double was for the knot. You had to have a 100% knot. I would use a bimini. And the, and then how do you connect that bimini to the snap swivel? It really didn't make a difference how you've tied the double to the snap swivel because, you know, now you got double the strength there. Right. So I have a knot that I kind of kind of came up with that's pretty cool. Um, you could have done a cat's paw. You could have just done any sort of a knot to attach it because as long as you pull it. When it gets to knots, any knot that you tie, to me, the biggest secret is wetting it and pulling it as tight as you can and you should break it occasionally especially with light tackle cinch it because the a knot breaks because of the movement of the knot right if the, if the friction it, it's that fast the heat and the friction will pop it so I, I, if i look at your knot if i'm on someone's boat and i see it it's not pulled that tight i know it's going to break so i always just go pull it a little bit tighter right away right. if i can um so if, as long as my crew pulled it tight when we first started, I tied all the knots. I w I'd come off the bridge if we broke something off and tie another knot. On two pound, you can almost use a Palomar, a single going to it. We, cause we would break off quite a few sailfish on two pound trying to catch them. And sometimes it got pretty hectic. So they just tie a quick Palomar that does test close to perfect. But you know, on two pound and a billfish, you're n never really using full drag. No. You're going to free spool a lot. I mean, you know, you're only using a half pound of drag on two pound. We caught, the f you know, white marlin. They're probably some of the first records on two. White marlin and sailfish on two. Um, the two we caught in both oceans. That could be still record. I'm not sure. I think uh, Pacific might be. I think the Atlantic got broke. Um, but we were tying a double with two pound. Right. To start out with every morning. We'd have like two rods of each one, two twos, two fours, you know, uh, six pound wasn't available back then. And uh, if we were using eight, I usually had a backup on everything. So right. if you broke one off, you can grab another one. So the promised land, when you would get out there, uh, I've always heard about the big seas. You know, what, uh, talk to me about what it's like when you see this monster from the abyss come up in the, in the spread and that grandeur that Jerry caught. Oh my gosh, the one we lost. Oh, that's a crazy story. The one we lost was on a calm day. And then the rough days were, you know, it can be calm as can be. But when it gets rough, it is outright some of the biggest seas you'd ever want to be in. Is the fishing better when it gets rough? 
Yeah, that's what's it's springtime. It's starting to bring them in, saying it's time to go mate. It's time to go lay your eggs. You know, here they come in from wherever they're coming, and they get up and they start tailing down sea. And you know, you're, you're baiting them in the middle of that, or they just appear, but they're coming in there to lay their eggs, so they're safe inside the reef to, right. to grow up. So you're you're up in the tower looking for tailors, and sometimes you'll see one that's just bright purple. She's ready to lay her eggs. And uh, the one that Jerry caught was one of the neatest things I'd ever seen. I looked offshore, and here's this bright purple marlin and f- four black, solid black colored males, males. Yeah. coming down sea. So I wheeled the boat around, and it had to be, uh, I don't know, eight to 10 that day, eight to 10 foot seas. So we get out there, and I get in front of them, and nothing. They, they won't even look at the baits. I, we got two baits out, one swimming scad and one skipping bonita, short. And I get in front of them and nothing, nothing. And and they're kind of tailing into the, they're kind of coming from offshore towards a reef. And I got within, I don't know, 50 yards of the reef. I had to turn around. I couldn't go any further and they're still coming. And as soon as I turned the boat around, they sunk down and disappeared. Man, I'm like, oh, I'm hitting stuff in the tower. Like, darn, 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 darn. I'm up in the tower getting beat up back and forth. I mean, you And know. he had a temper back then, right? No, no, I was pretty good back then. <laughs> no, I just, you know, here's a fish of a lifetime coming right. in. And so I turn around, I go back offshore to where I was kind of, I was kind of sitting on a point out there where the kind of, the bottom came out a little bit. So I'm sitting on this point, just trolling back and forth. And I look offshore and I see this big purple female and some males again. I was like, man, it looks like the same bunch. And here they come in again. And all the way to the reef I go, I had to turn around again. Darn. So I went back out to the point. And this is probably about, I would say from beginning to end, not be, or beginning to hook up, probably 40 minutes. Come out there and here they come again. But now the males turn purple and the female turn black. So I guess she released her eggs and now the males are releasing their sperm and coming down sea. And we're coming down sea, coming down sea, all the way to the reef, nothing. And I turn around and I'm trolling back out to my point and all of a sudden the long rigger goes down. And look back there, and we got her on. We got the the female out of that bunch on. And she's not doing much up in that shallow water. And within about three minutes, Scott Levin grabs the leader. And she just starts gagging. She had swallowed that J-hook. And uh, Greg, my mate, he owns the uh, Yankee fleet down there in Key West. <laughs> He's a good bottom fisherman. He reaches over there, and uh, my girlfriend at the time was a photographer, <laughs> And she got the best picture of the gaff being laid over this marlin. And we put he put a gaff in her. I came off the bridge, put a gaff in her. And we ended up putting like five flying gaffs in her. And it was 30 minutes on the gaffs. And she towed us in, I don't know, three circles. We had her up tight to the transom. And we did three. She took us three 360s in those big seas, just beating the crap out of us, which we, I guess we deserve for harvesting fish back then. But, uh, you know, know, Dunaway, I've never seen him. The happiest I ever saw Jerry, I think, was that fish and the first one we caught on eight-pound form. I have a video of that one. I've never seen such a great smile and such a quiet, humble guy. Um, Or sensitive guy, I should say. I don't know how humble he was. (laughs) But he was really sensitive. But that fish just took us in three circles and kicked our butt. I mean, gaffs were flying in and out, and she was fighting for her life, of course. Right. We were trying to kill her to harvest yep, yeah yep so we brought her back to the mothership and weighed her at sea and the mothership was rocking and the scale would say 11 something and then go down to 10 something and it stopped one time at 1060 i said done away it's a grander that's good enough right so we just called it 1060 and called it a day there's no sense but about the next trip down jerry came down later in the season it was slick calm that day and nothing was going on in the reef so I'm up in the tower and I just turned it offshore and we got about three or four miles offshore. And earlier in the day, I told the boys to put the one, now we're record fishing because Jerry caught his grander, but we always had a, a, thir- a 130 ready to pitch for a big fish. And if I told my crew something, do something half the time, it'd take them about a day to do it. So this day I went, done away. I said, we're never going to catch as many Peters as uh, we're never going to catch as many Granders as Peter Wright or Brazaka or any of those guys out there. I said, I said the record's like eleven something on thirty pound. Let's just throw a thirty pound. Let's just go for the record. 
So I said, guys, put the 130 away, get a 30 out, and get it ready. And on a 30 pound, you can fish a 30 foot leader. So, so the same leader we'd use for the 130, we just stick on the 30 pound. And we get offshore, and I see this big school of skipjack tunas pushing out there. So I go get in front of them, and we had a skipjack tuna out and a long rigger for a teaser. You, did you know it was a marlin chasing these, these skipjack tuna? No, the tunas were just feeding, but right. I figured there might be a marlin around. I right. mean, it was a beautiful bunch. And I fished around a bunch of them and never got a bite, and I fished around some and have got a bite. And on the short bait, we just we had two 130s out, but with baits with no hooks. So we had a skipjack and a long and, and a, uh, a, a bonita in the short. So I troll by him, and here comes this fish, and she was big. I'll never guess how big, but she was big. And she came up, and I go, throw the 130, throw the 130. And I look, and Dunaway's down there with that 30 pound. <laughs> I was like, oh, shoot. So anyhow, this fish came up, and he eats the long skipjack, come tight on the teaser, and we just get the swivel back. You know, she ate it. I'm like, oh, my, this fish is going to go away. She just got fed a six-pound bait. And so Dunaway's got his skipjack right about where that one was. And here she comes again. She's going to eat again. And she eats Dunaway's 30 pound. My knees are shaking. Uh, this is the biggest fish I've ever seen in my life. Dunaway drops back. We're tight. We got her on. So I run out of the tower and I go to the bridge just so I can drive the boat better. And we're hooked up. And she's just really not going anywhere. Just staying like she's just staying right there about 50, 60 feet in the school. So I'm like, Dunaway, push the drag up. We got to get her attention. Push the drag up. So I push the drag up and we got her attention. But she still wouldn't jump, do anything. She took a lot of line out, went deep. We got a lot of line back. She went down deep again. And by the, about the third time, this is after an hour, the fish still, I don't know if she knows she was hooked. You know, the, those big baits in her stomach, she might be used to that little bit of resistance. And we started winding the reel in, and I lined the, winding the line on the reel, and with those graphite reels we had back then, it spread the spool. And I looked down there, and the rod's really bending. I said, Dunaway, I think the, you know, you got to back the drag off. And, no, 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 we're fine. Pow, line broke. We, oh. we spread the spool so far, it locked the reel up. And that's why I could see the rod really bending over, bending right. over, and we popped her off. But that was one that I just told everybody. I'd never, to, I don't know, till you bury me, I probably won't tell you how big I thought she was. The big one got away. That's part of fishing. And that's part of why we're out there, you know, to, to chase these dreams and these fish. And, uh, you know, it's fun to get them once in a while uh, to let us know that, yeah, it's a confirmation that we're okay at what we do, but we will get humbled periodically. And just when you think you know you're, what you're doing, it's, um, you get slapped in the face. Yeah, today's reels, I think we probably would have had a better chance of catching that fish. Because everything's now is all, you know, latest and greatest, titanium, whatever it is in the spools, and we're not spreading them anymore. Technology's so much better. Oh, yeah. So the I, hooks I, are so much better. The fly, the, you know, the fly world, the, too. The leader material. Yeah. You, Did you the ever see a, is so, yeah, it's so tough. It, much different, right? I mean, that's all you guys use now for yeah, leaders, right? Yeah, but just not, they say the fish can't see it as good, but the, but the it doesn't, fray is easy it's tougher it's harder yeah that's what i noticed it's smaller diameter yep you got all yeah. everything you'd ever want in those leaders so it's it's so much better well after uh speaking with you a couple of weeks ago um i was talking to my son nick he said we got to go fish with skip and obviously we've made some phone calls and we're going to come with you you know in january i cannot wait to come hang with you on this legendary boat you know, captained by you. No, I'm looking forward to it. So I invited you. I got a trip before you and a trip after you. So I thought it'd be fun just to have some friends down. I like doing that. You know, just so we can relax. I can sit there with you and tell stories. I can let my captain drive the boat or I can go up and drive the boat. Or, you know, we just go out there and relax and not worry about numbers. And the fishing should be decent that time of year. We can throw flies. We can throw whatever we want. And it's so nice to have those type of trips where there's no pressure. It's not like a charter where you really got to produce. We can just go try different things. It's gonna be so, it's gonna be awesome. I'm really looking forward, you know, to hanging with you and uh, Nikki and I have not done so well with the offshore world, but I know Capos has got some fairly flat seas. Yep. And uh, we're gonna cross our fingers, and I, I know that uh, we're gonna be in some good hands. 
Yeah. Well, you, you said something earlier, you know, about it's fish stories. You know, look at what Hemingway wrote and Zane Gray wrote and some of the writers of the past wrote some great fish stories. And when you get back to it, you know, we go out there, we enjoy a great day and you come back with another story as, as we live life. Some people like to travel. They'll tell stories about going to Indonesia, Japan and, you know, what they do. We go fishing. We love the stories. Some people tell them better than others. <laughs> right. But when you're sitting there having a beer at the end of the night and you and you think about the, the stories that have come out, you know, it's like I took my wife out there to swim with a porpoise and tunas and I couldn't find them. I found this big school of porpoise and she jumped over and the porpoise kind of stayed around. And all of a sudden I looked down and this is off Capos. I'm looking at her and this big dark shadows coming up underneath her. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm about to go wife shopping. She's going to be dead in a second. And they were pilot whales, fortunately, but still they're dangerous. They've grabbed people, girls, and throw them like a, a bone or pull them under. This right. one girl got pulled under. And my wife is just taking pictures and having a good time. And she finally comes up and there's and there's another school came up under the boat. But the big bull, pilot whale, the male, he's got all those females with him. He's one really lo looking her over, you know, like, is this safe or not or whatever. I was scared to death, but now we got a great story and good pictures. Right. So you don't know what you're getting no matter what you do out there. Yeah. So, you know, that's why I think we, you know, the, the people like us that love being on the water, I don't care if, if I'm flats fishing with you, I'm having a great time. I go down the Keys, you know, catch a bonefish or permit. I'm having a great, it doesn't have to be. I can go out bass fishing and enjoy the hell out of it. Trout fishing in a stream. Yeah. It doesn't matter where it is, but that's my passion and i really love just wherever i'm at if i can get out fishing it's just a blast and catch something that's a bonus well, i can't wait to go and hang with you guys down there in costa rica what uh if somebody wants to fish with you how do they get a hold of you i have a website they're pretty easy to find they're, everything's kind of crossed over in this day under my name under captain skip smith but having the hooker back <laughs> You know, and, that combination is, is, is awesome. And for some reason, hooker was all those names were taken on a web. I don't, I don't understand why, but <laughs> so I had to go to the hooker sport com for the boat. But, but between all the tournaments I do and everything else, you know, I think people can find me pretty easy out there with the, today's technology You put my name in or the boat name in and it'll pop up. Well, thanks for joining us. I can't wait to go fishing with you. I can't Skip. wait for a few more stories. Absolutely. Let's go make some memories. More. Yeah. All right, bro. Yep. Well, thanks again. You're welcome. Did you get through your whole list? A lot of it. Yeah. There was a couple other stories I thought about in, in, in there that I was hoping I wouldn't forget. I brought my yellow pad, too. I was going to write notes as we went. but Well, if you got a story you want to tell, this this No, no. Out. There was something else that we were, we were going over there that there was a story that, you know, when you start talking about knots and leaders and... You know, the learning curve, I went from, we started fishing for records in 83 when IGFA opened some categories. And Jerry brought down a, like an eight pound rod and reel and some line. And, you know, we, all right, what leader are we going to use? How are we going to do this? How are we going to present the bait? Rigging the bait. I mean, people ask me about the secrets to light tackle fishing. And it, I mean, it starts from filling the reel to, all the guides on the rods. We end up putting so many more guides on the rod to displace each little friction right. and, 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 and pressure on it. And so it went from designing which reel we're going to use to the rod design to the, the knot you're going to tie. Yeah, it's a plethora. And then to rig the bait. And then the bait and switch started to be able to get the fish so aggressive. And really, you want to know who invented that? Fly fishermen. Right. Well before me, they were doing it. And that's how I came up with the idea of like, we can do the same thing of fly guys, but just throw them a bait. So here the fly guys were already doing what the guys are doing now, teasing them up. Well, you know, what's interesting. I was fishing with Eddie Herbert and Jim uh, Lambert in St. Thomas um, on the real tight. And we were doing a, a, a show together and they were talking about baiting and switching. And he was talking about the percentages of a better hookup. And with the fly guys, um, when the billfish came up, I used to always throw the fly right in front of the fish. I'd get the bite, but I, it wasn't setting the hook. And so then the bait and switch, Jim Lambert was saying, make sure you throw the fly behind the fish. So when I rip the teaser out, you get the going away bite. And so that's when he started talking about the percentages. It was like 30% greater for a better hookup when you put that bait behind the fish. 
with the whole bait and switch. Yeah. On fly. Yeah, you definitely want that going away bite. And we hate that as as a bait and switch because it's it's not a good bite. Really? Because yeah, Lambert was doing line. that. He was baiting his fish with the all tackle rods. That's with a lure. Were. He wasn't using a bait. On a lure You're it's right. better. On a lure it's better because you're just gonna get that lure in front of them and get the hook to come across just like you would on fly. Right. If you're pitching a bait, you want that fish coming with you so you can drop it right down its mouth. Interesting. So yeah, but you know, they found all this out over years. I remember first fly fishing with Rufus when we caught the world records down there. You know, the as the fish was coming at us, he would just throw the fly, you know, just take it out of gear and the boat's kind of just slowing down and he'd throw the fly in front of him and try to dip the rod to him so the fish would be turning a little bit by the time he tried to set the hook. Later in life, we found out the fish came close to the boat and he threw the fly and the fish was going away, the hookup ratio soared. So much better. But all those little things that you, you know, it took some people so many years to, to, to learn and now everything's in a magazine. Right. So we didn't have all that teaching that they have now. You can get online and become a professional. Right away. In your head. And then right. you gotta go out and apply it and not be shaken and 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 still every trip I learn something to this day. You know, you're it's like you you know, whether you break one off or what the hell happened there? We have never done that before. And what's interesting is that when you learn, it's like that was so obvious. How come I didn't get that a long time ago? Yeah. Nope. Yeah, it's like setting the hook. With tarpon fishing, it's, it's really difficult to keep your cool and just keep stripping until you feel the weight of the fish in your stripping hand. Because you see that bite, and the first thing everybody wants to do is rip on that rod tip, you know, set the hook. And obviously, we know that you cannot do that. All you're going to do is poke the fish. He's going to jump out of the water, and the hook's going to fall out. But I remember for years and years and years, every time I'd trout strike, and the fish would fall off where I'd miss the bite, I'd look at my right hand and go, will you just stop it? You know, the profanity would begin. I hate my right hand because every time the fish would bite, I'd rip that fucking fly right out of his mouth, you know? But every bite's different. Every fish is different. You got to either wait a second or... You know what's interesting? You're, but go you're, left or but right. You're, you're so right. Yeah. Because now, you know, over the years, the tarpon would come up and maybe sip the fly and keep coming at you. And you keep stripping as fast as you can to try to feel the weight of the fish. And if you don't feel the weight of the fish, I would trout strike as hard as I could and try to get that hook at least stuck in his face. I'd trout strike, hold that fish, and stomp on the boat with my foot to get the fish you know, to, to turn, turn, to go the way. And then I'd drop the rod and set the hook. But there are so many different idiosyncrasies of refining the game. Yep. It's funny you stomp your foot like that. When I was a mate in the... Uh, my, one of the first charter boats, I jumped from the, like, the bridge to the cockpit and I got screamed at by the captain because of the noise it made. The sailfish went away. It was on the teaser. Right. Now, if we tease the fish to the boat and he gets under the teaser and, and won't go back, we start stop on the deck so he'll turn around and get, get away from the boat for a second and go back in where the bait is. Right. So here you're stomping to try to get that angle you need to set a hook. Right. But from a tarpon bite to, to, to anything on fly, you know, your trout or whatever, snook, Every bite's going to be so different. You know you got to either wait or turn the rod sideways or keep it low or pull it high or whatever you got to do to set a hook. Right. But everything's so different. And it's like, and like you said, darn it, right hand, this was a, this was a tarp and I was supposed to do this. You have to add lib. It's a dance. Yeah. For sure. You know, it's funny. Um, I can't remember the captain's name, but I did a segment for Good Morning America with Marsha Bierman. And we were down in Isla Mirada catching shellfish. And... Um, at that time, I'd already been doing a lot of tarpon fishing and learning how to hang onto the fly line to, to create drag. And when my son and I would fish, we'd always palm the spool of the spinning rod and, and max you know, have the drag set lighter so when the fish jumps out of the water, he lands against a light drag. But once he's back in the water, I'd hang onto that spool and fight him with maximum pressure. So we're doing this segment and she's talking about her techniques. You know, this is the short pump with the hips going forward, you know, her style. I don't know what that, if that was that much different. The than pelvic anything. thrust. Yeah. And um, so we're on the boat. She gets a bite. We got a sailfish on. And so I'm talking to Marsha. So tell me about this techniques that you have to catch this fish, you know, quicker. So she's going through it and the other rod goes off. So we got a sailfish on. So I run over and I grab the other rod and 
and I, I reel it up tight. I get the fish on, and now I'm palming the fish, and I'm ripping on this fish, and I'm cranking down and ripping and holding the spool, and the mate's yelling at me, don't touch that spool, don't touch that spool. And I, and I just I said, just stand back, please, for a second. And I'm ripping on this fish, and I pull him over the boat. We take the hook out, and I go back to Marsh, and I said, now, now, now talk about this technique, about how, how you can catch this fish faster. And... Uh, and the captain, I think it was Alex somebody. Alex Adler. That's who it was. Yeah. He leaned down out of the out of the upper the station. Calyx. Yeah. He leaned down and fist pumped me because he goes, You you can fish with me anytime you want. <laughs> he was so happy because he hated the color of the line that Marsh and her husband were using. And here I was using, you know, Their tackle, my yeah. own way to how to, you know, hang onto the spool and catch a fish. And just by chance I caught a fish that was probably not as mean as hers, but it made me look really good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love Sorry, Marsha. I, I love aggressive angling like that. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. I mean, fight them. Yeah. And if the fish is taken off, that's when you're supposed to stand back and just hold the rod and laugh and let it rip his line because right. you're not going to stop him. You are going right. to break him off. Right. But if, if you can keep him coming, keep him coming. Right. I feel better now, the same way you do. I think at 64 now, I'm a better fisherman than I ever was because now I've been able to sit back and relax and not, you know, do all the things I used to do. I'm more patient when it's time and when they're ready to catch. I can boat handle as good as anybody because all the light tackle fishing I've done. So, you know, at this stage of my life, you think that, wait a second, this old guy doesn't have it anymore. You know, it's a young guys are doing so good. Right. But the, 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 in my, the way I think now is just so much better you know, well, you're like a refined, saying, sophisticated captain and angler. You know it and we're so doing, well. And we're doing it. We go out there, we're catching them. Are you That's still fishing thing. the lightweight stuff, the four pounds? Um, I did in Panama this last year, yeah. We fished them eight pounds. We caught two blue mar on an eight pound for lady angler. One was just barely under the record. It was so much fun to be able to do that again. The boat handles so great on fish like that. You know what? I would think that after... At some point, you might not want to do it, but it's just like when I go to the golf course with my son to to play and to perf- and to compete with something on the line is so much more fun. Your focus and the, and the attention paid is is paramount. You know, if you're out there playing or or fishing um, just for fun, yeah, it's fun. But to put something on the line, like in a tournament, or put some money on it, or a four-pound test, now there's a reason to pay attention, that much more of a reason. Yeah. Well, the way I set the boat up right now, it's like we're tournament ready every day. So no matter what fish I, I, we, we hook, I know it's advantage us because the tackle is perfect. Everything's rigged perfect. You know, the boat's running perfect. So you got everything going for you. So every day to me, we're almost tournament fishing. Right. We're making sure we do everything. My crew, we're making sure we go by as much IGFA rules as we can. We want the people to hook their own fish. We want them to pick the rod up out of the rod holder. And if it's a lure, you know, and it's a marlin, pick it up, grab it. Don't worry about it. The drag set, relax, you know, push the drag up. The lever's right here. So we want to make sure everybody does it right. But we know our tackle is like tournament ready every day. Right. I have a two, a four, a six, a eight, a twelve. I got all of Dunaway's old rods with tournament line on them, up forward, ready to be used at any time. How can people not want to go fish with you? <laughs> you know. So, so if they want to try one at four, if right. fishing's real good, try to catch one on four. Have at it. We're going to give you a fifteen foot leader. We're you know we're not going to give you a thirty foot leader just to say we caught a number. You're going to catch it the old fashioned way. So you're still in the game. Yeah, yeah. So still we're ready to do it with whichever way is they want and. And most people that we're, we we're getting are just people just want to come down and have a good time. Just your average person. We Is have, it aggravating just to have the average person who doesn't no. understand the uh, the level of sophistication and the level of of uh, purpose that you have? No, we're I'm still doing. I'm still trying to be as fair to the charter as I can. We're fishing twenty pound, not thirty, like everybody else. So you're catching your sails and your mahi on twenty pound. So we're going lighter. When we're out there marlin fishing, we're using a lot of 30-pound and some 50s, depending on the charter the, for the average person. If they want to try to catch one lighter tackle, we caught one the other day on 20-pound of blue marlin. You know, people want to try it lighter. How big was that fish? Um, that was a pretty good fish. It was 175 or so, 200. Oh, cool. It was a nice fish. I couldn't believe it. And the fish came in so tired and didn't even jump that much. We got pictures of taking the hook out of the, holding the bill and just taking the hook out and had the lady angler lean over the side 
but uh you know we're so we're trying to make sure that we can dial our stuff down so people really get their catch you know be more fair for the fish right and the fisheries but i don't care what it is you know we're out there every day trying as hard if not harder i'm burning more fuel than i should making sure that you know we're running to different areas just not taking our time and trolling and and just having fun we had one charter this year and they caught 42 blue marlin in three days and is was, that over a fad yeah that's out the sea mounts on the fads but every day it was like 16, 13, and nobody got wet. I'm not backing up fast. We're just taking our time, letting the fish jump, not looking, not worrying about the big numbers. We but we could have got 20, probably something in there. Wow. If I wanted to hot rod it around and, and, and do that or fish in all 50s, but we just hook a single and catch it. And Enjoy put, it. Respect put, this fishery. I only put two, four lures out when we're out there, two teasers and two lures and pitch, pitch into the short ones. And I mean, but it's so much more fun to watch the people get to see the fish and not worry about catching that 20. Just, all right, okay, we caught 14. So we spent an hour in a fish. I enjoy seeing the marlin go down deep and watching the angler get their butt kicked. Right. You know, right. With catching them on stand-up gear. What should uh, Nikki and I expect when we come down in January? Decent food, good calm seas, and whatever the good Lord brings us, there should be some marlin still around. Hopefully we get to throw a fly to a marlin for Nikki or you. Yeah. and. There should be some sailfish around. There still should be a few dolphin around, and hopefully we'll find some tuna schools out there. We can mess with them too. Oh, awesome! So that's that's uh, we don't do much bottom fishing there. The bottom fishing is kind of out. It's all pelagics, but it should be a great time of year. And it looks like it's already starting inshore fishing right now. It's been last week was really good. But Captain fished a half day, caught four sails, two for three on blues, four mahi. I mean, you know, I I'd given off. I'd given up on the offshore stuff because I've been so sick for so many years. But after speaking with you and reading your books, it's like, I'm back in. We got to go. Let's call Marsha and get some of her magic medicine. Because <laughs> much offshore stuff she did, she got sick she her gets, whole life. And she got the pharmacist to make her a special batch of stuff. And she was out there every day. I got the fish with her. And she was, uh, you know, she was really a leader of stand-up stuff, you know. Whether, whether you fought a fish like her. Because it did save your back if, right. if you did it right. But, you know, to be able to stand up, and that's what everybody's doing now. Everybody wants to catch them standing up instead of going to the chair and, you know, make it more fair. Make it fight. more of an athletic yeah. achievement. Yep. Yeah. Right. So you're really, you know, you're really pitting yourself against these fish, whether it's, you know, on 50 pound and really pushing your body against theirs, or if you're just trying it on 12 pound or 20 pound to catch something on a light tackle and, you know, to really be able to challenge yourself and not break it off. I mean, there's a lot more to angling than just pulling. I mean, you got to know right. when to back the drag off and you feel that acceleration of the fish to back the drag off between the belly of the line out there, you know, getting hung up and jellyfish and all sorts of goo out there and other fish in the ocean and then jumping 200 yards from the boat, you know, and the line's still going straight down. I mean, if you don't back the drag off, you're going to bust it off. Right. It's not like we're in five foot of water. So there's a lot more to angling out there when to push it up. You just said yourself, you know, here you knew the advantage. You got your hand on the spool trying to max that 12 pound out to make sure, you know, get everything you do once you get that fish's head coming. And you're actually doing what's best for the fish too. Sure. The faster you catch the fish and can get your picture or whatever you want, get your numbers, get your flag up, let that fish go healthy. I mean, so it works both ways. So we're enjoying the sport, enjoying the weather, getting our serenity out in the ocean with the blue water and you know just or, or the gr beautiful green water in the flats you know you love this as much as ever don't you yeah i'm just it's just it's it's my happy place good for you <laughs> all right looking forward to fishing with you all right i'm looking Thanks, forward to yeah. part three yeah <laughs> after <laughs> when we get back <laughs> right that'd yeah. be awesome all right all right that's Thanks, date. yeah all right thank you you're welcome you know, that's the beauty of, of fishing and stories. There's always one more story. We just shut down and skip. You got another story to tell us. Yeah, we were talking about the sound machine right. before. So as quiet as this room is that we're doing this podcast, it reminded me of the things I went through trying to do the sound machine. So I take a goggle eye in the bucket and I put the microphone in there to pick it up because I'm going to record a goggle eye to play it back while we're fishing. So I got the goggle eye in, in a bucket and I'm trying to record it on the boat with a hose flowing, but the sound was picking up the pump and all the other noises through the water. So I've got this goggle eye. So now I gotta go, darn it. So I gotta take the goggle eye, put them in a bucket, take them up to the dock, 
to get rid of the sound of the hose right. and everything else coming through. So, so you're, you're so you're going to try to take the sound of the goggle eye and and the, and 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 boom that through the the sound system of your boat to make it sound like a bunch of goggle eyes are swimming above the fish. I'm trying to make them grunt. I'm trying to take some croakers and make them grunt because when you get a fresh croaker for snook fishing, usually he's worn out. The guys that catch the snook, they want that gro- the croaker that's been in the pen for a couple of days because as soon as they stick the hook to it, it's going right. and the snook are more aggressive. So now I'm trying to do that with the goggle eye and uh, Fascinating. make it sound. And then I was trying to make him splash the tail, go splash, 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 like he's trying to get away to make that sound. So then I'd get offshore and I'd try to take a bonita and do the same thing, but I was always getting the sound of the pump. So I was so into the sound, I was trying to take every different bait I could and make it make sounds so I could play it back. So I had a skipjack tuna splashing in a bucket. You know, I'd have to take the sound out, put the bucket up on the covering board and make them splash with the thing in there and just splash and get that tail going so I could play that. So I was trying all sorts of sounds. Did so, it work? I only the fish can tell me. So, cause but the, you, but the, you did that. I mean, so that you fished with the it. sound machine making the sounds of these baits. Yep, I, I, I did that just before we shut it down. But when I did play it back, I didn't know if I was playing it back too loud and it sounded like a 2,000-pound goggle eye because <laughs> you don't know where your, your volume is. Right. So it still need a lot more studying to be done. But it was just, it was, I was so into it. I'm still into it. So you're still researching this? I'd like to, exactly. yeah. I don't have the funds to really do what I did before, but I'm still thinking about what I can put in a boat, whether it's just a big boom box back in the lazarette and play Hank Williams or Blondie or <laughs> who I had to play. But you it's know, probably ma- Johnny Cash that raised all those fish all those years. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I think it was between Hank Williams and Blondie. My brother would put Blondie in for a little while, then Dunaway put in Hank Williams and back and forth, and that's why I fished in the tower a lot. <laughs> I don't know. If, I, I don't care for the music when I was concentrating fishing. But they would fight over the stereo system. But I still oh, yeah. think there's more to play in that stuff down the road if you could really get it right. Right. So I don't know. I'd still like to play with that stuff some more. But you know, you- now that you're kind of into this and you see the connection between the boat sounds and the boat raising fish and the and the sound of goggle eyes, et cetera, I kind of wonder in retrospect if you think maybe Hank Williams and Blondie and the loud music in the back of the cockpit might have prevented fish from coming up to the boat you think I, no i think it's i think your engines are still Dominant. making more sound than, than that stuff out there but when i was playing stuff in the water there was no doubt there was a difference so to be able to take that into the future let's just say you go over a wreck and you can start playing the sounds of that croaker and get those groupers start turned on or the snappers start turned on like okay where's this thing i love to eat you know, it's like, boom, then you fire your bait down. You got them on point. You got them all on point. Right. Like when you go to catch a tuna, you, they might be milling around, but that first tuna starts to dart at your bait. The other one wants to beat them to it. Right. So it makes you know, a lot of sense for sure. Yeah. And that would, let, that'll turn on a lot of different fisheries where you're seeing those snook laying under the bridge all day long and they only turn on from what hour to what hour. But if you can get the croaker playing in there and start getting them all excited, then all of a sudden you drop one down there. Everybody. And they're like, I'm going to beat you to this. You start that frenzy. Yeah. That's what I was always trying to do is get their attention. I know they're down there. They're down there all day long. And all of a sudden at 3 o'clock, the sailfish start biting. It's like, what turned them on? You know? It, it, one of the things I've seen happen in, in Los Sueños during the tournaments, we're catching them pretty good. Then all of a sudden there's about an hour lull. And one of the captains go, oh, this tide change right now. How do they know there's a tide change 50 miles offshore? You know, but they know that. I don't know why it is. The current may still be moving, but they shut off for about an hour, then boom, they're back on again. Crazy. So you know they're down there all day. What can we do different to get them to bite all day long? And that's the things I was thinking of. Right. I mean. Outside of the box. I'm trolling for swordfish at night now. I'm switch baiting swordfish at night trolling. Really? Yeah. Not drifting. In Capos? No, out here. here in Florida. Out here. I go out there and. I put two planers down and troll, and the planer trips, and we tease the swordfish right to the boat and throw them a bait. I've caught five out of six on six pound, trying to catch a six pound record, switch bait them. Just Actually, re- no, I did four out of five. The other one I caught uh, just throwing another bait. And no one's there. ever done that before. Well, they're doing it more and more. There's guys I've caught them on fly now. I think Croninger, Roy Croninger caught one on fly out right. here, a couple, and Bouncer. Rostigy. Yeah, uh, he caught his just deep jigging on fly, but I think he's trying to do it at night now with Bouncer. Right. Now that everybody's seen what I'm doing. 
So now we're switch baiting swordfish. It's the most fun to have your clothes on that far offshore off Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> That's crazy. But if it's calm, you have to come out. Night fishing is tough, though. You might have to medicate yourself. No, good. I know. I'll, I'll leave the night fishing. Come on, well, I'll let you guys. throw the fly. <laughs> you, you, right. Would you like to catch one of those things on a fly? There's, there's better things to do at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're in by midnight. Four. We're in by midnight. <laughs> She'll still be here. <laughs> I don't fish that late. Uh, Anyhow, all right, all part right, three. Then. All right, bud. All right. When I saw its West Side Story, I 